think what we're going to discuss now is that how do the kinetics of response differ for different types of therapies? Let's just say, say standard type of systemic chemotherapy that when we trained as fellows and early in our careers, you give chemo, you see response. If you don't, it's pretty quick. You know if it's not working or not. Now, how does that actually differ now in the, say, the immunotherapy era? I think what I'd like to do is I'll ask Ivan and Madoff maybe to uh, discuss that. So I think, you know, you're right that initially we thought that cell-based therapies or, or therapies that engage, for example, T-cells would take a long time to work against cancer. And whereas antibodies, for example, would work more directly and more quickly. Um, I think, however, as we are now developing more effective therapies against cancer, that has, in fact, also begun to change. So while we've traditionally thought that immune therapies may take a long time to actually have an anti-tumor effect, that may not be the case. We're, in fact, seeing in solid tumors now uh, more, more rapid effects with these sorts of therapies. The, 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 the one point, though, though, to remember that that's distinct between immunologic approaches and non-immunologic approaches is the memory of the immune system. And so I think the immunologic memory allows an effect to continue or persist for a very long time in contrast to traditional therapies, which is the one big difference between um, immune therapies and non-immunologic therapies, in my view. Right. I mean, I, I agree with what you just said. And I would say, you know, from a community physician point of view, you know, the thing that, that we like to see when we have a patient that comes in with a large tumor burden is a very rapid reduction in, in, in the disease, whether it be adenopathy or leukemia burden or whatever we're looking at. And, and that can occur with, uh, certainly with chemotherapy, and it can also occur with, with immunotherapy. But depending on the type of immunotherapy, oftentimes, and what we're seeing now with a lot of the clinical trials, it's not necessarily the rapid kinetics, as, as Madhav alluded to, but it's the tail that we see that's occurring later on. And that tail is precisely because of the persistence of an immune uh, consistently activating memory response that can last for many, many months over time, which is not something that you can see with traditional chemotherapy. And that's a very important point to remember, especially now that a lot of immunotherapeutic uh, therapies are becoming mainstay of treatment. I think there's limitations also. It's, it's very good points. Uh, with respect to maybe too much of a good thing, I, I mean, thinking back with the CD19 CAR T cells where if you have a long-lived response, you basically are going to knock out the B cells forever. And then, you know, maybe it's not a big price to pay, but maybe expensive. You might need lifelong IVIG because you're not going to make antibodies, and that patient's going to be hypogammaglobinemic. But I guess compared to dying of a cancer, it's a, but I think we still have a lot to learn, as we say. I'm looking back at the vaccine trials. We had major vaccine trials in lymphoma. And what was fascinating is that I think we look at all facets. I think we appreciate the immune system, but I don't really truly believe we understand all the, the parts of the immune system. What I mean by that is that the patients who receive, let's say, vaccine therapy, what is the adjuvant? What, how do you stimulate, you know, make it a better response? And also, some people would use, for example, rituxan chemo. Some use chemo alone. None of them proved to be the best. It, nothing's been FDA approved yet. But I thought what was interesting is those individuals that mounted not only a humor response, made an antibody against the, the target, say, usually idiotype, but also mounted a T cell response against the idiotype, had the best responses with respect to, say, objective responses, as well as maybe the duration of progression-free survival, but never enough to get approved. I think that's kind of interesting. If you use rituximab and knocked out B cells, they actually could see a T cell response, but the B cell response waited until normal B cells started coming back. And sometimes you'd have a delay in nine, 10 or more months before you said the, the antibody response. So I think that based on that, to discuss the challenges of immunotherapy trial design. So I think most of the trials we would say we're going to be single agent trials uh, with respect to monotherapy. We first have to learn about toxicity, dose, and, and schedule. But what about time to uh, event endpoints, uh, median progression for an overall survival? And what about study duration? As you just mentioned before, it can take a delay before we start seeing, or the, the tail. And so the question is, how long do we treat patients? And if they're still, I guess my, my general consensus, uh, my point would be, as long as the patient is not progressing, and they're not doing poorly, maybe we have to continue therapies longer than what we normally would do for chemotherapy-based uh, uh, type of treatments. Matt, do you have any uh, ideas on so, that? So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we have learned a lot from these new class of drugs that that's perhaps somewhat differing rules apply to immunotherapies than they have applied to traditional chemotherapies. 
Uh, one of them, obviously, is the concept that uh, the tumors may actually look bigger in certain cases initially, while the tumors are actually still responding. This is probably more true in the context of solid tumors than, than mm -hmm. hematologic malignancies, but certainly has yet not been fully explored in the context of hemalignancies yet. So that's the so-called pseudo-progression concept that actually can occur with the immunologic response. So maybe like a local inflammatory uh, response can That occur. makes a lesion look bigger yes. for a while, but yes. it's actually a responding tumor. Gotcha. Um, and so that has allowed uh, many uh, clinical trials to in fact consider the possibility that you could actually allow the patient to stay on trial for him to eventually get better. Uh, the, the other issue, however, is that uh, because the, the bigger effect in the context of immunotherapy may be at the level of getting a more durable response. Um, it may, in fact, indeed be the ability to have a uh, so-called separation of the curves, if you will, or, or a reduction in hazard ratio of death that may be more important, or, or, or having a progression-free survival at a defined endpoint, as opposed to the traditional progression-free survival that we have typically used, at least in the context of myeloma, for example, for, for traditional FDA approvals. And so we may have to take another look at what are the optimal um, sort of endpoints as we design some of these studies. Any comments you thought? Uh, I, I, again, I agree. And I would say that, you know, we already have, this is a situation, I think, with regard to immunotherapy, we're probably learning more from the solid tumor side than from the liquid, which is rare, because normally it's the other way around. But certainly, you know, another example of this is with Provenge, uh, the, the prostate cancer vaccine, where, you know, its FDA approval was actually gotten based on an improvement in overall survival and certainly not in PFS. And, and I think this speaks to the fact of, of several things. One is that it can be a delayed response, but two, potentially what the immune response is doing is altering the, T cell, the, the tumor to make it more sensitive to subsequent therapies as well. And this is a concept, again, I refer to a randomized phase three trial that ultimately got FDA approval, but that we're seeing more and more in a variety of other settings. And um, to, to further comment on a point that Madoff made, you know, this concept of pseudoprogression has been so recognized that, again, in the solid tumor arena, there are now, uh, in addition to the RESIST criteria that are currently used to judge uh, clinical response to therapy, there has been a new paradigm that has been put in place which are called immune RESIST criteria, specifically taking into account this fact that, that you can have this pseudoprogression that can eventually wax with time. And I think it's been very difficult when you're at the bedside with the patient sort of being able to hold on when you think somebody is transiently getting worse. But the reality is we now have data, and, and I would encourage people to, to not be so aggressive in thinking that the patients are actually progressing when, in fact, they may long-term be responding. I think that's a great point. And I, I, I go back and look at, we, at Roswell. We had done the initial therapy in CLL uh, with uh, uh, basically lidolidomide, and we saw tumor flare. And the tumor flare, patients were scared, well, I got pain, and it's red and inflamed lymph nodes. But then after you monitored the patients, we can't stop them fast because we found out later, and when you saw those patients actually were responding, most of those patients had objective responses. But if you first looked, you said, well, that patient's progressing. No, they're not. They're having an inflammatory response because it's working. Do you have any comments, Dan, maybe? Yeah, so uh, in, in leukemia, it's a little bit different. These are yes. very rapidly growing tumors. Yes. And I, I think our first endpoint, which we will be very satisfied we will achieve a higher rate, is the complete remission rate. Okay. Uh, in fact, what we are looking today is the death of the complete remission. So morphology by itself is, is not enough. You want to get, you disease, get a, a right. negative medical. Right. So that's our first goal. And complete remission is a very good uh, endpoint. Uh, the, the survival in, uh, in these patients, especially in relapse settings, is so short. Yeah, you want to get it longer, but there's also the option of doing transplantation, which can uh, impact the overall survival. So really, the, the early responses are important, uh, extremely important. Uh, why minimal residual disease? Because with chemotherapy, you can do it, uh, but this develops quickly. There's clones that become resistant. Immunotherapy is a totally different concept and uh, will work on, or likely to work on those few cells that remained after uh, chemotherapy. So really you want to reduce the tumor burden as much as you can. And I think what we're going to do is there's going to be a lot of learning points with respect to what happens, what resistance pathways we're going to generate with our novel immunotherapies. Are there going to be cross-resistance to other type of similar therapies with antibodies for maybe we get resistance and maybe the pathways will be similar? We don't know yet. I think what's important is there are no standardized 
um, validated tests for T cell activation or response. I think we have to work on them. They have to be included. So correlative studies, I think, are very critical with respect to what we're doing. It's not enough to look at response or duration, but we need to look at potential biomarkers of response as well as biomarkers for which therapies are best. I think to move on.